Hey guys, it is your girl Nadge. I'm here today. I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you for being here with me again for another video. Um, I want to talk about a very important topic to me today. Sort of how to navigate a relationship between a person who is a believer and a person who is not a believer. And what I learned from being married to someone who is not a believer. Now, I'm Christian. I grew up Muslim. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in just a second. Sort of my conversion and why I change faiths. Oh, by the way, like there's like the sink drip, 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 dripping in the background. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, um, I'm going to speak specifically from my perspective as a Christian person. But I feel like this can be applied to any religion. If you're a Muslim and you're married to an atheist, if you're a Jewish person and you're married to an atheist, whatever it might be, I think that you can find some nuggets of wisdom in this. And this is not me providing this wisdom. It's actually just the word of God. It's all from the Bible and it's from what people have spread. You know, that's what I love so much about the Bible and Jesus, not to sound too much like a Jesus freak, um, but the fact that it's survived through centuries, you know, to battle and, and conquer and, and approach the same things that have plagued us since the beginning of time, you know? It is so relevant and it doesn't matter what time period you're in. So I actually um, recently watched a video that in my moment of just um, struggling with some of the normal day-to-day -day and overarching challenges that comes with being a believer who is in a relationship or married to an unbeliever, I went out to seek a source of inspiration. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's get right into it. So this video is called How to Live with an Unbelieving Spouse. And this is from um, what looks to be a married couple. Well, they, they are a married couple. Um, and a, a channel called Marriage. It's a channel called Marriage After God. Um, and it's a wife and a husband. And I, I, watching the whole thing, I really digged their vibe. I really digged how in sync they were with one another. And um, that made the scripture that they were delivering and sort of some some tokens of inspiration and, and motivation that they gave that much more powerful for me um so we're gonna react to that together i mean it is a 31 minute video so we're not gonna watch this whole thing together but i'm going to give you the overarching themes and i took some notes um yeah this is the creme de la crop i i think that this is probably one of the most helpful videos that i found out there so the, um, I grew up Muslim and, you know, I get asked all the time, oh, well, where is your family from? Are they from Sudan? Are they African? Are they Ethiopian? And I just go, no, just regular old American people. Um, I live in France, but speaking from my background perspective, um, I had come from generations of Christians. My mom and my dad had come from generations of Christians. And in the seventies, my mom and dad both converted to Islam because that was what spoke out to their heart. And I have absolutely no regrets being raised in a Muslim household because it gave me this foundation in just, how do I describe this? An unfallible, infallible um, connection to God, you know? Because I think the Quran is one of the most beautiful books um, to just speak on the devotion, you know, and the love that you feel with God. I feel like I really got that foundation from Islam. But growing up my whole life, I always sort of felt like I was wearing a dress that was a little too tight, you know, or I was wearing shoes that were a bit too big. It just felt like, although I had this reverence for this beautiful religion, something just fell off for me. And... My grandmother, uh, we called her Madir, which, you know, in a lot of black Southern American households, 
grandma, we call her Madir. And it's it's taken from slave terminology, really, um, merging the words mother and dear, and you get Madia. And Madia was a beautiful woman. She was the type of person who could tell a joke. Oh, God, I don't want to start crying. She was the type of ter person who would um, tell a joke but it wasn't a joke for her. She was being dead A serious, you know. But the way that it came off um, was hilarious. And you could just like fall on the floor laughing. And she had this very just sturdy, frank, but also beautiful and warm and loving, infectious sort of energy about her. And I remember she used to have a little cassette tape player in the, in the kitchen. And while she was cooking, which, you know, for a black southern grandma, cooking is a huge part of everything you do. I mean, everything revolves around the kitchen. And she'd be in the kitchen cooking, and there would be this cassette stereo tape, this black cassette uh, boom box. Um, maybe it had a CD player to it, but I don't think. I think this was so old school. It was literally just a cassette tape player and a, you know, FM radio, FMA radio. And she would listen to gospel while she cooked. And sometimes I would just walk. And, and I remember being a kid, being in my grandparents' house. And sure, it wasn't, you know, a place for kings. It wasn't, you know, incredibly huge 4,000 square foot home. But it was beautiful. And you felt the warmth in it. And you felt the pride in it. It was always clean. And uh, I remember my grandma had this big gold armoire well she still does I me and my granddad is still alive and in the family room in the dining room there's all of this furniture you know the furniture that kids can't touch there's big gold armoires and there's beautiful china everywhere and I just remember seeing my grandma and being like wow this is an example of what a marriage is you know she and my granddad were so in sync I never heard them raise their voices one iota and if my grandma was being picky or sort of critical towards my granddad he just did what she said you know and that was almost even more of an example for me than my parents' marriage was because my parents' marriage ended in divorce when I was 13 but I remember being in my grandmother's kitchen and she would just randomly say um God, this is making me really emotional. I'm so sorry, guys. She would just randomly say, like, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. <laughs> and I just remember hearing her and seeing her say that and see the devotion and see the commitment and the love in her heart for whoever this father person was that she was talking about. But through her example of just seeing her be a loving wife and mother and grandmother, um, a staple of the community. Like she and my granddad would just go during Christmas and Thanksgiving and just give some of the less unfortunate people big boxes of food and cans and stuff that they had collected throughout the church. Um, tons of people of all races, all backgrounds, my whole childhood. God, this is really tearing me up. I'm so sorry, guys. They would come over and have Sunday dinner with us, you know, and that was just my grandmother in so many words. And I'm not saying that there are not Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim or who, whatever people who don't have these same values. But my grandmother was a Christian. And so that had a deep impact on me. And I remember for as almost as long as I can remember that. It almost felt like I was cheating on Jesus by being a Muslim. And, you know, I never really said much about it growing up. I know that when I was in a Muslim private school, the straw that broke the camel's back when I was nine <laughs> was that I wore a pair of SpongeBob SquarePants socks to, you know, school. And every day we had prayer in the musala and, you know, we would all pray and that was a part just like you know it, you would go to mass at a catholic school us going to juma was very very normal at a muslim school and i remember i had on these spongebob square pants square pants socks and i was just innocent kid you know i just wanted to run around and play and 
you know, paint my nails like my big sisters. And um, there was a lady, like a equivalent, a Muslim equivalent of a nun, who just was like, no SpongeBob SquarePants socks, no nail polish. And I just remember being like a little nine-year-old kid, like, what? I love these socks. My mommy gave them to me. Like, why can I wear them? And I went home that day and I told my mom, I don't want to go to that school. You know, I really don't. And my mom has always been my biggest advocate. And she put me in the same school that she was teaching at, which was much better because I'm an artist and my mom taught at an arts-based elementary school. And so I got to be, hang out with my mom all day and also get this exposure to the creative, creativity, you know, the creative hemisphere that I didn't necessarily get at the school because there were other things that they were emphasizing, which again, no offense to anyone. And if that's your bag, that's wonderful. Um, but for me, it just, like I said, it felt like I was wearing a dress that was too small or shoes that were too big. And I go on this journey, I, I wouldn't really too much bring up Christ or Christianity up until literally, guys, maybe like six months ago, a year ago, like, and I'm 31. So that, that goes to show you how these, these journeys towards self-salvation, towards spirituality, towards discovering who you are on the inside is very important. And it's something that is so... Um, personal. <laughs> it's something that's so personal. And um, it was also a, a matter of me not wanting to offend my family because the person that I am today, the strong woman, I would not be it without my family and the way that they raised me. And part of that is my Muslim backgrounds. Um, although, albeit, I don't consider myself ever having been a great Muslim because even from a young age, it just didn't feel right for me. And I think that that is okay. I still have so many Muslim friends and family. Um, I embrace diversity in the world as well as people of other backgrounds and religions. And I think that's what is so important, especially for us Christians, is to embrace a multi-faith perspective. And so, my first encounter with Christianity was the Unitarian Church. So, I can't exactly remember how I discovered it. I think I just independently discovered it. I think I went online and I researched churches for almost sort of like a liberal Christianity because I knew that I needed to kind of ease myself into it. It was a beautiful congregation and um, there was, I just, I finally felt free, you know? Even though I knew that I needed to delve deeper into sort of more of an orthodox Christian experience, which ultimately led me to the Catholic Church, and I am now Catholic, the Unitarian Church really was that bridge between Muslim Najwa and I'm finally embracing that I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and this is what I believe in this is what gives me warmth and love and comfort in my heart you know but I can still continue to have compassion and reverence for people of all kinds working to do good in the world just imagine little Najwa going throughout her 20s and you know, reading things here, doing things there, attending the Unitarian Church. And it was about two years ago that I just walked into a Catholic church. I found one that I thought was suitable. I walked up in there in Paris and I felt the sense of, oh my God, I'm finally home. At that point, I have to go into my marriage because I never had any idea that I was going to fall in love with an atheist. I fell in love with the person and not the idea, you know, and I still to this day will defend that to any ends of the earth. Now, I don't think that everybody is made for a relationship between a believer and an unbeliever. Some people just, that's not where they're at, you know, but me, I like a challenge. And my goal in here is not to convert my husband. And it never has been from the beginning. Although he might argue a little differently. Uh, 
my goal has always been to coexist and to have a loving, respectful marriage while embracing each other's differences. And for the most part, we have done that. But it would be totally um, unrealistic to expect that in a relationship with such foundational differences that there aren't challenges. Now, my husband, his background is actually Catholicism, which I find so hilarious and ironic. You know, my husband, they're Portuguese, and so that adds another layer that we come from two different nationalities and two different kind of upbringings. My mom is very, very outspoken, very much like my grandmother. And pretty much the women in my family just run the whole thing. I mean, I, and, and, and it's not in a negative way. It's like the men let them do that. And I think that comes back to the Bible. You know, the Bible basically says that the woman is the church and the husband is Christ, you know. And Christ is constantly trying to re-energize and renovate and bring the church up to a standard where it is accessible to everyone, you know. And so there's this dynamic between that. And I just feel the men in my family, especially since... As I explained, we do have those Christian roots. And I think that can also be traced back to African roots as well. You know, the the the, tri the tribe chief, if you can almost think of, you know. But at the same time, having the matriarch who they're okay to let, you know, um, sort of take the reins. When you look at matriarchs and patriarchs throughout society... You kind of understand it. And I'm not advocating for either of, of those. I think that we're in this together and there should be equality. Nobody should be ruling over anyone, especially not in 2023. But um, there is this quality in my family where women are assertive and outspoken, um, but with grace and reverence and class. And the men sort of, they give, they give way to that. They give lead to that. And so, um, my husband grew up in a completely different dynamic. Um, he grew up in a dynamic where his dad was very, very outspoken. And I found these practical pieces of advice from this video to be extremely helpful. I will link it below in the, bi the bio. Um, basically, they give four pieces of advice, okay? And they concentrate on two um, pieces from the Bible. Well, they concentrate on various pieces of the Bible, but two of them stood out to me more, and those two are associated with two of the parts of the video. So the first part, they explain about to go and get the right perspective. And so they talk about this couple that's basically an unbelieving husband and a believing wife. Real story, where the husband had encountered all of these issues with uh, pornography and sex addiction and really had just insulted his wife in his manner of living and his behavior. And... Um, the wife, in turn, said, basically, I'm going to stick by you as my brother in Christ. I'm going to stick by you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to abandon you. And it's really interesting if you look at this video, but I, 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 I um, recommend for you to look at this video in full because I think that that was incredibly, incredibly um, inspiring. The second point that they said is don't leave and then they re relate don't leave to a statement that I think a lot of people use or quote from the Bible that a lot, a lot of people use in this particular instance. Some of them with theories that are good, some, um, but it's 1 Cor uh, Corinthians 7 uh, verse 7, uh, hold on. Okay, so it is actually 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12 through 13. And it says, To the rest I say this, I not the Lord. And this is coming from, I 
think the perspective of Paul. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. So to the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. And so basically that's saying, don't give up, don't give up, don't leave, you know? Like there is a reason that you're here. And if your unbelieving partner continues to be an unbeliever, yet wants to be in the marriage, God is telling you don't leave. And so a bigger interpretation for that to me says that God knows that this is still his child. You know, his light of love, of protection, he's still holding it over this unbeliever. And in many ways, you're so important to this. Because you are carrying the spiritual journey basically for your family, you know, and your husband, although he might not be living through the word or he might not be living through your particular spiritual or religious doctrine, you're setting an example. And that, that, that brings us to the next one. Uh, the, the video says, pray for them and pray for yourself. And then finally, it says, be an example. And this be an example is extremely, extremely important because um, this is probably the piece of nugget that I got the most help from. So Peter 3, 1 through 2. So First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. So this is what uh, they sort of reference as be an example. So it says, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. And so... Us as the believers, sometimes when someone is, when they are by their very actions, not just by words, but by their actions and their words, insulting your Lord and Savior, insulting something that is so, so sacred for you in your heart, it can be very, very common for you to think that they have no connection at all with the Lord, but they do. Their connection is through you. And in these minutes where you just see sort of the fretful temper tantrum of a child coming out and um, you want to tell them, no, you know, like you need to get right with God. It's not going to carry anything over with them. It's not. What will be better is for you to set that example, you know, continue to pray, continue to pray for them, continue to try and be patient and understanding, listen to them, you know, show them kindness. Um, I think that's, that's really like the bulk of it. I'm looking here at my little notes. But look at your partner as a sister or a brother in God. And if you can do that, and if you can try to be true to yourself, they are going to be elevated just by association. So um, don't give up. Don't leave just yet. If you are in an abusive relationship, do not want to encourage physical, mental, uh, financial abuse in any way. 
If you are in an abusive relationship, get out. But if you are just simply a believer in a relationship with an unbeliever, and sometimes that is hard, my advice to you would be to listen to these four pieces of advice that they give because they are humdingers. Get the right perspective. Don't leave. Pray for them and you and be an example. So that's how I'm going to leave it, guys. I will catch you guys in the next video. Thank you so, 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 so much for being here. Um, make sure to click that like and subscribe button. I would love to have you guys on my channel. Keep uh, coming back. I'm going to be delivering things about life, about love, about motivation, about being an American, living in France, about uh, marriage between millennials. <laughs> like, There's so much good content to come. I'm so happy that you guys have been here, and I'll catch you in the next one.